Hi, I'm uh, Pete Little. I'm an interventional radiologist from Newcastle and following on from a really interesting session on IR for animals at BSIR. I'm here with uh, two of the participants. We've got Alex Horton, uh, interventional radiologist from the Royal Surrey and Gerard McLaughlin, uh, a veterinary IR from Fitzpatrick Furls also in Surrey. So if we just kick off by asking what sort of cases do you do? You do? What's, what's one of the interesting cases you've treated recently? Um, I mean, from my perspective, it's all very interesting. Um, you know, very lucky to have the uh, Fitzpatrick referrals nearby. And so we've kind of built up a relationship over the last five years of helping each other with uh, with cases. And we, we do a whole mixture of things from uh, intrahepatic shunts, prostate embolizations, big AVMs in the liver, uh, HCCs, chemoembolization. Uh, we've done some intra-arterial chemo into the bronchial arteries, bladder, um, glued a facial AVM. Uh, most, a, a very interesting one was a stent in a rottweiler's penis. That was one of our inaug inaugural cases. Um, I suppose probably the most, um, from my perspective as a, as a sort of hepatobiliary IR, the most interesting case, uh, was of a bunny, a small miniature schnauzer who had a large intra and extra hepatic shunt uh, with arterial portal shunting and portal venous shunting, which required percutaneous gluing, portal venous gluing and arterial embolization uh, with a good outcome. Um, so you're, you're encountering sort of similar problems that humans would encounter and using sort of the techniques. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there are adjustments that from my perspective, we have to make not, not just the size. Um, but the, uh, the types of pathology, there's a learning curve with anatomy, but the, 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 the fundamental IR techniques are identical, which is, I suppose, why it works so well, because Gerald's got the uh, animal experience and anatomy and knowledge, and, uh, and between us, we've got, I've got more experience of the kind of crazy li liver stuff, and so together we come together and work quite well like that. Superb. So, so Gerard, what, how did the service start? Um, so I was working in New York and I was doing an interventional fellowship there and I was coming back to the UK and had a job offer to start at Fitzpatrick's and fortuitously Fitzpatrick's is across the road from the Royal Surrey Hospital and then also next door to the vet school. Um, and Alex's brother is, a, um, a professor at the vet school. So Alex had reached out to us and said, you know, I'm here. I'm, I've always been interested in helping animals. You know, I'm a dog owner and animal lover. And if you're doing anything along the way, the route of interventional work, let me know. So it all just kind of came together quite organically. Um, and then we were doing some interventional work. And as we started to see these more and more complex cases, particularly vascular cases, you know, the help Alex could give us became invaluable. And we've been able to offer our patients something that, you know, previously there wasn't an option for them really in Europe. And we've been able to um, offer these dogs and their owners you know, a lifeline that they previously wouldn't have had really. So it's been invaluable for us and for our owners. What's the, what's the, um, animal you'd most commonly treat? What's so, the sort of common ailment that yeah, we, you'd think of? <laughs> so we only, I know for. Yeah. So we are uh, primarily a, um, dog and cat hostel. We do occasionally see some rabbits and things like that, but Alex and I have only operated on dogs and cats so far. Um, and 80% of our hostel caseload is, is oncological. And so what we now see more than anything for interventional radiology is prostate cancer in dogs. And prostate cancer in dogs is really uncommon. It makes up only 0.6% of all dog cancers, but we're seeing at least one case a week coming to us because we now offer embolizations of treatment. Um, and prostate cancer in dogs is super aggressive. So the median survival time with chemotherapy is only hundred days. And so now we can offer embolization. We're seeing these dogs at nine months, 12 months, where in CT, the prostate is still 45% smaller than it was pre yeah. So it's really been a game changer, particularly for, for prostate cancer in dogs. Alex, uh, what do you think are the challenges ahead for, for this sort of developing service? Um, there's a, a, a challenge in some ways with the equipment. So I think we, we use a lot of human equipment across, but there are some areas where we would like to perhaps tweak some of the stuff, you know, lengths of catheters, torqueability, perhaps size, diameters, sheaths, all that sort of thing. Some of it is more pediatric sizing. Um, so there's, so there's something in the kit and also the availability for, uh, it's difficult for, uh, Jared to justify ordering, you know, large, I mean, for instance, Lepiodol, we might use Lepiodol a couple of times a year to glue these complex things and you can only buy 
it in 10 vials at two and a half thousand pounds. So, you know, there are things like that. So there are some equipment challenges and we are working with some of the companies to try and tailor some products towards us. Um, we have some challenges in terms of the room. So at the moment it's not, you know, there aren't really veterinary interventional suites. Um, there are one or two places in the US that have big rooms, the kind of rooms that you or I have, but none of the veterinary places in Europe have that kind of equipment. It's all done with C-arms and things. And yes, we've got subtraction, but it would be lovely to have cone beam CT, particularly for the, the liver tumors, because that's what we're used to. And that's how we do our angiography. Um, and uh, a more dedicated room rather than a modified operating theater. Um, you know, th that sort of stuff. And I think also in terms of our, our pathways, so that we get a lot of uh, well, Jared gets a lot of referrals from out of area, out of country, and then they come in, but they'll often come a bit like seeing an international patient. They might have half the imaging or, you know, we, and we need to repeat it. It's difficult to justify with owners sometimes repeating it, getting full triple phase livers, for instance, that sort of stuff. So the pathways, proformers, you know, there are lots of ways we can kind of bring it up to what we take for granted in, in the health service with that. I mean, I, I can just imagine um, from seeing the, the talks, um, there are some unique challenges because yeah. uh, they're, they're not obviously not humans and accessing the femoral artery may not be a thing or, or might be very difficult. So how, how do you combat some of those issues? I mean, it, it depends on the, the patient size. I guess, you know, we're working from a two kilogram chihuahua to a 70 kilogram St. Bernard or something, you know, so there's huge variation in, in patient size. And of course, you know, we'll use everything from micropuncture sets. Sometimes we do surgical cut downs. We've done a few of them, the femoral access, um, ultrasonographically and things like that as well. And when we'd love to do more ultrasonographically and our, yeah. our radiologist is, is really keen to do that. But, you know, it always comes back to that point that I can't tell the dog to lie still and keep their leg elevated for 24 hours after yeah. procedure, you know, so there is unique, uh, uh, problems with just working with animals rather than, than people. For me, I think one of the biggest problems that we face is, is the cost of things as well. Cause obviously we don't have an NHS for animals and people have pain yeah. insurance, but as you know, the equipment for these procedures is, is not cheap. And so when we're buying the same equipment from the suppliers that, that will supply the NHS, we're not buying in the big bulb that you buy and we don't get the same kind of discount we're yeah. as a private practice. So that cost has to be passed on to the owner. So that's one of the biggest hurdles we meet is often, um, you know, how, how is this going to be funded and certainly you know, we often run it. I'm not making much profit on these for the hot, so I'm probably working in a, a bit of a negative profit sometimes, but I'm very fortunate to work in a place that prioritizes, can we really develop this technique? Can we help some owners and, and not worry too much about the costs, I guess, from the possible point of view. Well, I have to say I'm extremely jealous and uh, it's a fascinating area. And how would an IR like me get involved in this exciting world? Not, or is there, is there, is there potential for other centers around the UK, do you think, or? I think it's always an option for them. Um, I think it, there's not many, unfortunately, there's not many people in the UK who've done IR training in animals. Um, uh, and we have a very progressive clientele who come to us for this service because we're quite established now over the last five years. And, um, unfortunately we have seen cases that come from other centers where there's been some complications and Alex presented one of those cases yesterday of stents that are placed in the wrong location. So what it's like yourself, unfortunately. You need a critical mass of cases to, to, to... Be proper training. I think what's nice about us is we'll never, I will never have the, the huge plethora of equipment that you'll have in a human hospital, but we have a pretty good stock of equipment where they can get us out of most complications and various different catheters and wires and stents and things like that. And that's a really expensive thing to set up. I remember, yeah. um, what I, they did an audit recently, they told me I had about four nurses worth of equipment in a cupboard. So. You know, there's not many centers who would invest that in a service that is trying to establish itself because I are in the very field is not what it is in the human field. It's a yeah. very new discipline. You just put a very much a tertiary thing. Exactly. Yeah. So most, a lot of what I see, I'd say 50% of what we see comes from other specialist centers. Yeah. So, so it goes. I uh, think the, it. the it, you know, if you look for like the romantic sort of dream moving forward, be you know, in our career, I would like us to potentially ultimately be a, a site where we've got a service and we can train other people and we can offer yeah well Gerard mainly will offer IR subspecialty fellowships we get a lot of um you get a lot of visitors, visitors and interns and people coming through and actually to then formalize that as a training program so people can then go off and start their own service yeah. would probably be 
the Not way sort of small you i mean it's never going to be huge numbers is it? no a small yeah. uk network potentially or, yeah and yeah. i mean we have, open another center but you have a lot of contacts in europe and stuff and yeah. we've been over there and done a couple of cases and so you know there there is a community it's just so much smaller as i suppose it's like ir was 50 60 years ago for us oh fantastic well thanks very much for your time thank it's you really thanks for inviting us along and uh no giving us the opportunity to show our our work.